just little personal notes, you know, and Brother McAnally just cherished those things so wonderful. And uh, I think that they're in the library at George and Becky's house now. If you're ever up there, you might ask George and Becky to let you read Brother Mac's correspondence. Uh, but first time I know that Brother Benham came to this particular place was in 1961. And he preached in uh, Beaumont, Texas for us. Myself and an Assembly of God pastor and a UPC preacher sponsored Brother Brown came there and we had him in the American Legion Hall. And uh, I didn't know anything about the message then. And uh, Brother Branham, I, he told me he's coming hunting out here in Arizona, so I offered to take him to the rifle range in Beaumont, Texas, which I was a member of, to let him shoot in his gun. And I remember distinctly he told me that he only had three shells. That's all he brought with him. I thought, what kind of guys this would go hunting with three shells? And he said one of them was to shoot to see if his gun was still in sight. And if it wasn't, the second one was to correct it with. And the third one was to kill his pig with. Uh, folks, I come to know Brother Branham well enough later to know that he was perfectly all right. He wasn't planning on missing it anyway. But Brother Branham came here in 1961. We've got some pictures of him here with the brothers, Brother McAnally. And uh, Brother McAnally had an old, an old pickup truck with a little homemade camper shell on it. And the uh, camper shell for windows, just round holes with screen wire of them, but the, you stopped them up and Brother McAnally had taken some big hubcaps and put a hole in them and had a screw in the brace there. And, when he got ready to travel and just put that hubcap back in there and screwed that nut back on there. And that's the only thing that I asked for whenever Brother McAnally passed away and Brother McGraw gave me that camper shell and I have it in my home. And I've got it protected and someday if I find a, the right truck, I'm gonna buy it and put it on it, and donate it to whatever museum or memory of Brother Branham somewhere. But Brother Branham came here pig hunting and he killed a pig, and if you went to the den, you will see three javelinas, 61, 62, 63. And then Brother Branham came back here in 1962 with Brother McAnally and some brothers. But then in 63 he came, and here's where the question of controversy came, because Brother Branham was hunting here. I mean, this is where he'd camp, but he would always leave in the morning and he'd go up. Brother, those in cage those mountains over there and go up that draw and go over that saddle right there and when you get up on top that's a plateau and the mountain runs down from Sunset Peak and the fingers run out like this you know just some of them short and some of them long you know mm -hmm. all kind of shapes and you'd, you'd hunt out on those fingers out there and uh, Brother Branham in 63 had, uh, had killed his pig up there and when he brought him back to camp, he told Brother Norman and Brother Sothman, he said, now that herd of pigs will be up there tonight, and said in the morning they'll still be up there. And he said, I'll go up there, and you brothers go around on the other side, and I'll chase them down to you. So they left early in the morning and went back out to the road. And at the time, they didn't go out like we did. They had to go back through these corrals and there, and back down to where you crossed that last cattle guard, there's a fence goes in right there and you can go up on top, but they didn't do that. They went on the bottom and stayed down at the bottom and then and the, on the other side of this, just like this here. And that's where Brother Softman and Brother Norman was. And Brother Branham went up here. And when he got up there, it was about 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, a couple of hours earlier than it is right now. And he had not seen the pigs. But some of these things you can hear him say it on tape, others are things that the brothers have told me. The other part of it is things that Brother Branham said personally. That he got up there and uh, he had a, an apple or something to eat and he sat down underneath the tree and I think I, uh, we up on top, I think I can show you the point that he was on and possibly the tree he sat down under by just the things that he's described and said about it. And when he sat down there for a few minutes, he looked down and there was a cuckaburr on his trouser leg. And when he saw that, he realized that he was in that vision that he had had in December. That he tells about in Sirs, is this the time where he was sitting someplace and there was a cuckaburr. And he knew when he reached for that cuckaburr, the 
that there was going to be that blast. Because that's what he had in the vision. If he didn't know, you remember, he wanted to know, well, does this mean that I'm out here, I'm going to be killed or something? And that's what it motivated him today that he'd gone up to Sword Mountain. He went up there asking, Lord, does this mean the end of my ministry? And he raised up his hand like this, and that sword struck his hand. And you, you had the opportunity to go there. He said, this is the, he said, oh, a sword. No, the king sword. You know, you know, you've heard that story this week. But here's Brother Branham over here now, and he already knows that God has told him that it's, it's not his death. Because he said, Lord, if it is, do that. And he said, if it, if, if it isn't, well, then do that. And he said the anointing came, just almost took him out of the room. So he had an idea, you know, just himself. But, you know, Brother Bram said you have thousands of these visions and you never get used to them. These supernatural experiences, they're just, uh, you think of it, you know, you see them and you see how true they are, but they never become common to you if they're genuine. And so when Brother Brown went ahead, he was not disobedient to it. He just reached down and got the cook of bread. And when he did, there was that explosion that shook that whole mountain. Rocks the size of these rolled down the other side. The brothers were witness to that. And Brother Branham jumped to his feet. He won't know who shot him, you know. But then he, he said, told me, he said, I realized then, he said, you never hear the sound of the gun from the bullet that shot you. So just, you know, just momentarily. But he said he looked up and he said when he looked, it looked like there were seven dots in the sky. That's something he told me. But he said, with the speed of light, they come right and stood in front of him and formed a pyramid of seven angels. Mm -hmm. And he said, there was a mighty angel at the top and then lesser angels down each side. And he said, the one on this side is one that always meant so much to me. And you, you know, when Brother Branham, he brought the prayer line, he always brought it to where the angel was standing here. He'd always have you on this side. But the angel was always standing here. And he said, those angels there, and he said, they caught me up in their midst. What a sensation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul said, I know a man that went to the third heaven and saw the things that was unlawful for a man to talk about. Mm -hmm. I want you to know, folks, we're the only generation that's ever had a personal representative go beyond the curtain of time and Amen. come back and tell us, Amen. don't miss him. Yes. You know what's over there. And then an experience like this of those seven angels coming in and catching him up in their midst. And they turned him back east and said, go back east. And by divine revelation, you'll preach the mystery of the seven seals. Now, this is something that had been on Brother Branham's heart. And Brother Branham had been reading and studying about them. And, and you can read and you'll find things in church history and Larkin and and other things that, that people tell me all the time, well, well, you can read that in Larkin, you can read that in Smith. Brother Bram didn't deny that. But you see, with that gift that he had, he took all the truth and he put it in place. Amen. And, and to me, when you actually hear him preach the seals, he never revealed a lot of things. He just took the things in history and put them in place and told us where we were. Right. And then under the seventh seal, he said, that's the coming of the Lord. Yeah. So that's the reason that, that Brother Perry Green doesn't do a lot of the typing that other people want to do. As a result, it said that I don't have a revelation, but no, I don't agree with everybody's interpretation of the seals and what they do. But I believe every word that Brother Bam said. Amen. And I believe if I live a simple, humble uh -huh. Christian life, God will see that I that I make it. Just like, right. He said, the same simple faith that Enoch walk, took that walk with someday, I'll walk off of this earth. Amen. Amen. And uh, I really think that it's our, it's our own trying to understand or figure something out. And that's, that's a caution Brother Branham gives us at the end of the seal. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah, right. Just don't say it. It seems to say so and so or to imply so and so. And, and that's the reason I, maybe, maybe that's the reason I got a calling to still speak about these simple things. But Amen. I can look here and tell you right here that that Brother Branham lay down against this rock right here and took a nap. We got pictures of him laying right there so you can take turns of sitting down there. <laughs> but there right there is a rock that the prophet put his head on. And I'll tell you just like I did about the den and, and I mean the, the apartment. You got anything you need today? Just let faith come to you today. 
I want you to know the pillar of fire has been present in this Amen. place. Amen. God's been here. He visited us. Brother Bram said those angels hang around this place. That's the reason I get such a joy out of coming. Then Brother Branham came back in 64, and uh, they always built their fire right here against this rock. And I think there was about 15 brothers here, and some of them had killed their, their pig, and I believe it was hanging from that limb right there that uh, one of the brother boarders was standing there skinning a pig, and Brother Branham walked past Brother Roberson, and being as he was crippled, and told him, said, Brother Roy, get behind something. Because Brother Brown knew something fixed to happen. Uh, Brother McAnally was here. Brother Donnie, were you here then? No. You wasn't here in 64. Okay, and <clears throat> what had happened is, is that Brother Branham had been, I believe Brother Banks Woods was here, and Brother Branham had been somewhere with him the other day, the day before something, and Brother Branham picked up a rock and just throwed it in the air. And when it hit the ground, there was a whirlwind went away from it. And uh, Brother Branham said, Thus saith the Lord. Well, Brother Branham is standing here and they're fixing to break up camp. They're skinning their, their animals. And Brother McAnally's packing his and Brother Sotham's putting his away. And I believe Brother McHugh's and Glenn, his brother, and some of those are here and some of the Mosley brothers. We've got pictures of them that were here. And, and uh, Brother Branham was standing here with a shovel. And he was shoveling dirt on this fire, covering it up, putting it out. And Brother Branham taught us to always leave a campground like you found it. We'll police this area today and, and make sure we take all of the trash. I don't want no gum wrappers, candy wrappers. Leave, leave what, you know, the nature. Leave it here. And as Brother Branham was shoveling, a whirlwind came over this bluff. And you can see up by where it looks like that white cross. The area that sort of hollowed out like that? Oh, yeah. When it came over there, right there, it broke that chunk away from there, and it threw those rocks there and plumb out yonder. And the whirlwind came down here, over this area, three times, and it cut the tops out of these trees. Now, you can see that these here these here are smaller than that one over there. Yep. You see the trunk and all over here, these are pretty good sized trees. But you see they're shorter. It literally broke the top side of them. That one didn't get, that didn't happen that way. But these over here did. And it came down three times and Brother Branham took off his hat and looked right up in it. And when it left, right back over there where it went, he said, God spoke to Job in a whirlwind. Mm -hmm. And he said, the judgment of God will strike the west coast of America. Now the Lord had showed him that the day before when he threw that rock. But here was the vindication of this whirlwind come over here. And then the brothers began to notice. And, I mean, they began to talk about what was this. And my, you know, they're standing there. And, and some of the brothers, it was such a reverent thing to them they still speak about it in awe so there's one or two of them who was here said oh I was there and I didn't see none brother Branham exaggerated that isn't that amazing yeah you know some can see but they can't see yeah. then the next time brother Branham came over here there's brothers over here and he began to show them these rocks they found every one of them look at there is three-pointed regardless of how you look at it mm -hmm. see it's been cut oh look what I found today <laughs> you know now this one may have been broke here but it's amazing yeah. how many of these rocks break three points three points there's one two three four yeah three-pointed pyramid look at you bad little one five I got grace <laughs> Amen. And Brother Branham stood on this rock right here. That, that limb was back. And he stood up on this rock. And we've got movie film taken of him. And Brother Branham is showing the brothers how it's three cornered pyramid. But if you ever see that, I want you to notice. You know, most of us, if we drew this pyramid, we'd go like this. 
but Brother Branham goes like this. He goes counterclockwise. Yeah. You, you notice that about yourself. When you draw something, you wouldn't start over here and draw it this way. Yeah. You'd start over here and you'd draw it there and here and here. Now, I've wondered, well, why did Brother Branham do that? He drew it like an Israeli would draw it, from right to left. Where we draw it left to right. And of course, this rock has been here, and this is also the one that he was standing here when Brother Joseph was about 10, he was sitting here, and when he came out, it, the pillar of fire was on here. And of course, it's, it's added to some of the things that people feel about Brother Joseph. And I don't have any doubt that there was an anointing and a presence here. And then, uh, when... When I came into the message in 1964, Brother Lee Vale uh, came to me with a manuscript of a book entitled 20th Century Prophet. And he read me a portion of it and asked me if, uh, if I would help him print it. And I said, if you'll get Brother Branham to approve it, because I hadn't been in the message but about two weeks. I said, if you'll get him to approve it, I'll pay for it. So in the 20th Century Prophet book, Brother Vale mentioned some things. Uh, and you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's the yellow one that's called 20th Century Prophet. And uh, in there, Brother Vale mentions about the seven visions of 1933. And he said that one of the visions was a calendar was flipping. And the last year that came up was 1977. Yeah. So... Uh, until about 1972, wherever I went all over the world, I told people that Brother Bantam had a vision of a calendar flipping, and the last year that showed up was 1977. That's the reason he predicted 1977. Well, one day I got asked by a sincere believer, Brother Green, I've never heard that on tape. And I was pastoring Tucson Tabernacle, and we had about 300 people, and at that time there wasn't but about 400 tapes. And I just asked the congregation, we had some of the old folks, the old timers that were there, uh, who, who ever heard Brother Bram say it? And about half of the congregation stood up and said, yeah, we heard him say it. And the other half said we hadn't. I said, well, let's just settle it here. There's 300 of us here. You take these two tapes on, you take these two, and you take these two, and let's listen to all the tapes this week in this church. And whoever hears Brother Bram say anything about that calendar, we want to know it. Then we'll know. Because it, that, that's the only way I knew. Well, I came back and nobody found it. And, and they said, well, I know I heard it. So I did this very simple thing. I went to the ones that said they did, and I said, where did you hear? Do you remember where you were? Someone said, no, I don't remember where it was. Well, where did you hit? Well, I don't remember. But began to trace it back and found out that Brother Leo Mercer had written an article about Brother Bantam in 1977 in the Visions. And he had, they had, it had been published in, in Brother Matson Bose's magazine. And in there, Leo said that Brother Bantam must have had a vision of a calendar flipping. Hmm. And the last year that he saw was 1977. So that is how the calendar flipping vision came to be. Well, I also, when they challenged me on that, I said, well, I know where I heard it too. I read it in the 20th Century Prophet manuscript that Brother Vale printed. I read the original manuscript and it was in there. So I rushed in and I got that book. And when I turn over there, that portion's not there. And so I called Brother Vale and I said, Lee, when I read the manuscript, that was in there. That's where I heard it. He said, yeah. He said, I sent it in. And he said, Brother Branham came back to me and said, uh, Lee, I didn't have no vision of a calendar flipping. And Brother Vale said, oh, Bill, you did. You just forgot it. And Brother Branham said, well, I had the vision. I ought to remember. So Brother Branham went and got his vision book. And that's the only time Brother Vale saw the vision book. And looked in there, and there was no vision of a calendar flipping. And Brother Branham reads in the, from his vision book in the message called Hybrid Religion in 1962. 
he reads those seven visions right out of the manuscript, out, out of his vision book. So if you want to know what's in the vision book, you can read it because Brother Brown read it. He makes some comments for 20, but you can tell what he actually wrote down in 1933. So there was no vision of a calendar flipping. Well, at the same, same way, and, and I need to say this, I didn't have to pay for the publication of that book, The 20th Century Prophet. Brother Vale told me about some people, and I made some phone calls, and that's the first time I ever talked to Sister Dow and Brother Tom Brown. And those two and myself and 12 others each gave $100 and our names are still published in the front of that book as the 15 people who gave the $1,500 that printed that 20th century prophet book. And Brother Branham was so pleased when we took him to Jeffersonville and <coughs> gave him away. And we came home from Jeffersonville the first time I ever took him up there with 1,400 addresses. And that's the 1,400 address list that started spoken word. And the first spoken word message was printed in our kitchen on a mimeograph machine we had, and it was entitled Communion, because that's the only message that I had any control over. Everybody else said, you can't do it, you can't do it, Brother Brown, I'm not approved for it. And I said, well, I can do this one because I own this one. You don't even have the tape. I own this one. So we printed Communion, word for word. It was on mimeograph paper. Some of you may still have some of the original copies. We 10,000 of them. On a mimeograph machine. I still have that mimeograph machine. I still have the folder machine. I still have the mailing list. See, that's the original. To me, that's history. Amen. Yeah. Someday, if they ever have a museum or a memorial room, which I understand Brother Joseph and I are going to have in a new building, I want to donate that so that everybody can see those things. I want part of the, some of these rocks in there. Uh, it's always been my desire that everybody else share, have what we got. That's Amen. all. That's right. Right. I mean, I mean, if it's been a blessing to me, why isn't it a blessing sure. to everybody else? Amen. There's plenty to go around. Sure. Salvation, it doesn't take it away, but precious memories, all I say. And I didn't spend all that much time with Brother Branham, but every minute that I spent with him was a precious moment. Amen. Even if Brother Branham told me a joke, there was something spiritual in it. That's right. But Brother Branham was a lot of fun to be around. He was a pleasure to be around. Driving up in the, to British Columbia one time, I was reading the manuscript of the Church Age book. And uh, we was reading along there, and I was reading a portion of it. Brother Bram said, now, Brother Green, he said, that's all right, except on that next page there, he said, says so, and we got to change this word. He was reading it a page ahead of me, <laughs> the way it made me feel. And, and we read a chapter. And uh, there was a statement in there that, that convicted me. And I said, Brother Branham, I need to ask you a question. And he said, uh, Brother Perry said, uh, just go ahead and read my manuscript now. He said, don't, don't bother me with that. He said, now, he said, I, I know what your problem is. And before we're through this trip, I promise you, I'll tell you what to do about it. And I mean, I, was, I said, Brother Branham, do you mean God's already shown you my problem? And he says, yeah, and I promise you before this trip, so I'll tell you what to do about it. Folks, I mean, you just, there is no explanation for it. And that night, he took time to explain it to me. And he made me feel so good. I was just walking around condemning myself. It was the devil beating me over the head with, with something that I thought was just a terrible sin because I, 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 I'd repented and then I'd find myself thinking thoughts that I shouldn't be thinking. I called it lustful imagination. Before I married my wife, I didn't know a woman. I treated every girl I dated like I wanted my sister to be treated. But after I got married, I found out I'd think, well, my, if I'd have done this, and she'd have done that, and I'd have done this, and she'd have done that, and I found myself enjoying those thoughts. And I'd repent of it. And next thing you know, two or three months later, I'd find myself thinking, and I'd say, Lord, I'm sorry. And finally got to the place, well, why even repent? You're going to do it again. And that was really bothering me. I was a minister. I was faithful to my wife. I hadn't known anybody else, but it was thoughts. And that night, when Brother Bram told me he'd tell me what to do about it, he was sleeping on the couch in the motel we were in. And when I went through to take my shower, he moved his feet over and he said, Brother Perry, sit down here a minute. And I sat down in, at his feet on that couch. And he says, now about your problem. Well, I want you to know, folks, when there's a man fixed to uncover your life, 
and he knows your thoughts. You just wonder what's fixed to be exposed. And he said, now, about your problem, he said, you'll have to do the same thing I do. For Brother Branham to tell me he had a problem was just more than I could comprehend at that moment. I thought he was a such a holy man, you know, just a monk, you know, all the time, pure. But Brother Branham was a man. Yeah. And he admitted he was a man. Said if he made a mistake, Sister Meaty would forgive him. He'd forgive her if she made one. That's such a far cry from what I hear taught today in marriage and divorce. You just go out here and make a mistake and I'll just get rid of it. Brothers are using it as an excuse to get them another one. Right. That's all they're doing. The scripture don't teach that. Brother Branham didn't teach that. But right. I'm not here to preach. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> but anyway, Amen. Brother Branham said, Brother Perry said, you know, he said, Adam and Eve. He said, God put them in the Garden of Eden and they had all the innocence in the world. He said, he gave them a 40-foot concrete wall to stand behind. Now, why he said 40 feet, I don't know, except I've found out since then 40 is judgment. Right. Mm -hmm. And he said, as long as they stayed behind that wall, he said, Satan couldn't get to them. But he said, once they got out behind the word that God had told them, he said, then Satan had every swipe at them. Mm -hmm. And he said, now what you need to do, Brother Green, is you just need to remember what the word says. He said, God's word says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us. Amen. Amen. He said, now you're a red-blooded man, and you can't keep the birds from flying over your head. But you don't let them build a nest in your hair. And he said, as soon as you find yourself thinking those thoughts, you just get control of yourself. God, I'm sorry. I, I, don't, I don't mean to do that. And he says, God's word says he is faithful to forgive you. Amen. You see, devil wouldn't beat me over what I was doing. He'd beat me over saying, God won't forgive you. But he's a liar. Amen. God's word says if I confess it, he will forgive me. Amen. And you know what? That poverty. Devil knew there wasn't no need to bring it again. Because there wasn't any way. I don't, I don't have any trouble with that. By God's grace, I don't have any trouble. Amen. It, it, don't, it don't enter my mind. Because Satan knows that I know. That even if I do it, I'm going to stop and say, God, I'm sorry. I don't mean to do that. Oh, amen. And he's faithful to forgive us. Amen. I got behind that 40-foot concrete wall. Amen. Right. So, uh, <clears throat> we was driving along there, and Brother Branham that day asked me, he's, when I, when I put the manuscript up, he said, Brother Perry, he said, you know, I, I go up up in the wilderness. He says, I don't go just to hunt. He said, I, I go to get away from things. Brother Branham came out here because there wasn't anybody out here smoking, committing adultery, cursing. He loved to go up in the wilderness up there in Canada where there'd never been human beings because there wasn't no spirits up there. He could have peace. And, and we was driving along there, and he looked at me, and he said, Brother Perry, he said, you know any jokes? Well, I'm from Texas, and I was full of them. <laughs> and I, I said, I knew better than lie to him. I said, I, but I thought he's fixing to get after me. And, and, and I said, I said, yes, sir, I do. And to my surprise, he said, tell me something. Well, that was even a bigger surprise. To, for me to tell him a joke. He said, you know, he said, Brother Green, I, I want to relax. I, I, want, I want to get away from this. I want, I want, I want to break away. And about that time, a car whizzed by, and he said, see that car just went by? And I said, yes, sir. He said, we need to pray for them. They're going to need help down the road. See, even that was pulling on him. So, so I thought, well, I'll tell him a good one. So I told him one about a guy going to sleep in church. And uh, this guy would go to sleep in church, and, and uh, he, he'd doze off and go sound asleep, and it would embarrass his wife, embarrass the pastor. And the pastor just said, well, I'll just embarrass him, and I'll correct him from that. So one Sunday morning, the, the man dozed off to sleep, and the pastor said softly, he said, now, everybody that's going to go to heaven, would you raise your hand? They raised their hand. He says, now, everybody that's going to go to hell, stand up! Well, this woke the guy up, and he jumped to his feet. <laughs> and he looked around, and he said, uh, uh, pastor, he said, I, I have no idea what we're voting on, but you and I are the only two guys standing up. <laughs> and, and then Brother Branham told me one. Would you like to hear that yeah. one? Yes. Yeah. Would you really like to hear that one? You really believe Brother Branham would tell you a humorous story? Yeah. You see, Jesus had no sin, knew no sin, did no sin. And Brother Branham said Jesus had a sense of humor. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So there is a difference between humor and foolishness. The very thought of foolishness is sin, and foolishness is anybody who will not judge their acts of now versus eternity. Like the rich man. Uh, tear your barns down. I'll build bigger ones. I'll do this. And God looked at him and said, Thou fool. And God told us not to call anybody a fool. Amen. The very thought of saying, Well, I'll do this, then what? That's foolishness. Right. When you don't weigh your action day and realize there's going to be a price to pay for it tomorrow. That's true. I tell kids just like that. If you, even you in your life, if you can't figure out, well, I got $20 and I need to save it for, for tomorrow. I said, that's foolishness because if you can't think of it in the natural, you can't think of it in the spiritual. Yeah. And you look at a person's life, you can judge it. Kids, are going, they're not thinking about, well, if I do this, I'm violating the curfew and I'll get, I'll get grounded. That's foolishness because they haven't learned to do it in the natural. They don't do it in the spiritual. I don't care whether it's employees or, or church members or your kids or your husband or your wife. It, it's the same thing. And Brother Branham, he was, t he, so he, he told me this story and he said, well, he said, I got one about a guy sleeping in church and said, this guy sleep in church and he said, really, it was a Methodist church and he said, they didn't care whether he went to sleep or not, except he snored and he kept everybody else awake. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, man, he gets to get snoring and said, well, you know, just wake everybody else and rattle the windows, you know. And uh, so one day the man was at home asleep and Brother Bam said he'd sleep on the Chesterfield. Strange the little things you remember. See, I call it a couch or a sofa. Chesterfield in Kentucky, I guess. But he said this man was asleep on Chesterfield and said his wife was in the, named Molly, was in the in the kitchen and and she was uh, fixing some Lindberger cheese. And said the aroma of it went through the house and said it woke the man up. And he said, Molly said, that stuff stinks so bad a man can't even sleep with it on. Boy, that gave her an idea. So she cut a little piece of it off and wrapped it up real tight and dropped it in her purse. And next Sunday morning when he went to sleep, she just opened her purse very gently and opened that piece of cheese and sort of waved it over in front of him. And he's asleep and he says, Molly, get your stinking feet off of my pillar. <laughs> Brother Bantam and I, for two hours, we swapped stories. And uh, I guess he really liked my Texas jokes. About this guy, you know, that was from Texas, and they, they took him around the world, and they showed him uh, the pyramid, and he says, ah, we got one rock in West Texas out there in Gillespie County. It's one solid piece of granite bigger than that thing. <laughs> And they showed him a volcano somewhere and he was erupting. Well, Tex, what you got? Well, he said, we don't have nothing like that in Texas, but we got a fire department in Houston, put it out in 15 minutes. <laughs> and Brother Bam, he laughed at every one of those. And then they, he ran across this guy from Kentucky in the Army, and this guy said, oh, Tex, you're always bragging about Texas. He said, we got enough gold in Fort Knox that we could build a fence around Texas three foot high. And the Texan said, well, I'll tell you what he said. Y'all build it and we like it, we'll buy it. <laughs> and Brother Brown said, that reminds me of what? <laughs> so we, he told me about this Texan went up to Alaska and died. And he was a big man. And the funeral director up there in Alaska didn't have, didn't have a casket big enough for him. So he called down to Seattle to see, you know, if he could get one shipped up from the factory real quick. And, the supplier down in Seattle told him, said, oh, said, yeah, I said, we had one of those guys in Texas come over and die one time and said, we didn't have one big enough. He said, when we went to embalm him and we stuck the needle in him, said the hot air went out of him and said, we wound up burying him in a shoebox. <laughs> so every time I got something started at that, Brother Bantam said, where's the shoebox? Where's the shoebox? <laughs> and we got up to Brother Bud Southwick a day or two after that. And I, I just got to tell you folks, listen, because this, this is some of the most pleasant days I had with Brother Branham. We got up there with Brother Branham and Brother Bud Southwick, I mean Brother uh, Fred Sothman. They were sleeping in Fred's pickup camper, and Billy and I were going to sleep in a, in a, like a, a TP-10 out in the front yard. And the day before we got up there, there had been a Lila, Bud's wife, and her two little boys had been at the house, and a bear, a black bear, had come and got in the cabin, and he got in the flyer and we're just sitting there throwing and knocking everything around and 
Lila came up there and saw the bear and she grabbed the two kids and she started running off down where Bud was about a quarter of a mile away down toward the river and holler, bear, bear, bear. And Bud Southwick told uh, Brother Brown, and said, Brother Brown said, Lila was running so fast that them two kids is sticking straight out behind her and said she's running so fast when she crossed the river said she didn't even leave a footprint. She just walked <laughs> on the water. Right and of course we were all laughing, you know, because they was making so much fun. I said, Lila, of course Bud went up there and the bear, Lila had scared the bear so bad the poor thing left, you know. But uh, uh, we knew the bear was in the neighborhood. So that night when Billy and I went to bed, well, you know, the tent was about that big around and Billy's on that side and I'm on this side. I had a flashlight and Billy Paul came to bed after I did and he had a flashlight. And about one o'clock in the morning I reached up like this to pull my pillow up underneath my head and when I did I got a handful of fur. Oh. Oh. And I oh. eased my hand back down in the sleeping bag and I pulled my neck in and I said, Billy, Billy. He said, what's that? I said, where's that flashlight? He said, it, it, it's, it's over here with me. I said, there's something in his tent besides you and I. <laughs> I just got a handful of fur. So Billy Paul, he stood up and got over by the door and turned the flashlight on. And it was a house cat. <laughs> that somebody had lost on the highway somehow and had come there to Bud's cabin and had come in that tent to get warm. <laughs> and I'm telling you, the next day they didn't razz me. <laughs> this Texas preacher that can't tell a hair house cat from a from a bear. You better be boys, be careful boys, he might shoot us thinking we're a grizzly or something. <laughs> I mean just razz the daylights out of me. Well that day we couldn't go hunting because we couldn't go packing back in the mountains about 20 miles by horseback because <clears throat> it snowed that night. And they needed something from the store, which was so four or five miles down the road at Toad River. So I volunteered to go. And Sister Lila said, Brother Perry, why don't you take that little old cat down and leave it? Said, maybe its owner will come back by looking for it. So I took the little, the little cat down there and dropped it off at the store. And one of the boys went with me, one of Bud's boys went with me. And, and we came back home. And that night when we went to bed, I made sure that I had my flashlight. I made sure it was me. I, I'd had all the razz in that day. I thought a guy could stand. And so about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, Billy calls me over there and he says, Perry, he said, uh, you got that flashlight? I said, yeah, I got my flashlight. I said, what's wrong? He said, oh, that cat's back in here again. <laughs> well, I, I'd had all this kid and I could take. <laughs> so I said, Billy, it can't be that cat because it's on me too. And I'm 10 foot from it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just having to choke the laughter down, you know. <laughs> and, and when I turned the flashlight on, Billy Paul is standing up in his sleeping bag trying to run to the door. <laughs> Walking in his sleeping bag. And when I turned the light on, it's that little cat had come back. <laughs> and Billy, Billy gets out of that sleeping bag and he catches that cat and he's got the tin unzipped and he throws him at the door and he misses the door. And that cat just bounces back in Billy's face and Billy's screaming and by that time Brother Branham is outside in his long johns. Because he thinks that bear has got Billy Paul. So, next day the jokes was on somebody else. But we were going to leave that day. Oh and they saddled my horse, and Brother Branham came up to me with a paper bag. And he said, Brother Green, he said, this is your lunch. He said, now put that in your right saddle bag. In this side. I thought, well, what's the matter with the left one? But, well, maybe they got a reason for that, you know, the way they pack things. Maybe all, all of it's here, you know, and something else is over here. So I walk up to the horse, and I undo the saddlebag, and when I do, out jumps that cat. <laughs> Brother Branham had taken that and put that cat in that saddlebag. Poor cat, I don't know how long it's been out, but he was ready to get out of there. And he come out right in my face. And they filmed that. Oh. And they laughed. And then Brother Branham, he staged me like this. All right, Brother Green, let's see now. He said, now here's the way you get on your horse. 
and I'm standing on this side, so he has me put my left foot up in the stirrup on the right hand side. And when I get on the horse, I'm on him back. And that man, he just laughed. And he said, now, now go around the other side, you know, he want me to get on the other way, you know. And they just, they, I just let him have a ball out of me. That's <laughs> They may join me. So, in a little while, uh, I had taken a an old gray flannel suit with me. That uh, you know, I'd heard heard the testimony of Brother Bisco getting wet, you know, in the green checkered shirt. And I told my wife, I said, you know, if I get wet, I need something else. So I had, and instead of my hunting clothes, I took an old gray flannel suit to the mall to hold in. And I just put a white shirt and a tie in there, and I had my pistol and. They was all in the cabin, and I just went in my tent. And I put on my suit, tie, shirt, put my pistol on, got my Bible out. And I walked to the cabin door, and I just kicked the door in. I said, church is in session around here, you sinners. We're going to repent. And Brother Brown said, oh, please, Reverend, please, Reverend, please, Reverend. <laughs> I tell you that because I want you to know Brother Branham was a man. Yeah. <coughs> and that wasn't sin for him to enjoy himself. Yeah. And I find out, folks, it's fun to believe this message. Yeah. Amen. You don't have to go around with a long face. <coughs> Another one that I heard, you know, Brother Ewo Frank, he came over here and was at Brother Banks Woods' house and Sister Woods took a pie or something over to Sister Meaty. And when she comes back, Brother Frank, the German, meets her at the door and said, Meets her door. Did you see? Did you see the prophet? And she said, "Yeah, I saw the prophet." Well, sister, what was he doing? And sister Banks says, "Well, Sister Wood said, well, he had on an apron. And he was helping me to wash the dishes." <laughs> For a German man to be told that Brother Branham was washing dishes with an apron on, <laughs> unheard of. <laughs> but that's the way Brother Branham was. So when he came over here, he was fun to be around. He wasn't frivolous with what he taught or believed, but I'm telling you folks, there was just a lot of times when it, it, was just, it was just fun to be here. There was great enjoyment. But then in the midst of that, these supernatural things occurred. And because I had read that the cloud appeared on February 28th, I am the person that began to say that when the angels came down on February the 28th, the day that it happened, and I said Brother Brown was in the mountains in February during the hunting season, and on February the 28th he did this, and the angels came down, and when they departed from him, they formed the cloud in the sky. You don't find Brother Brown saying that. I assumed that because I didn't know any better. And then <clears throat> Brother Lewis uh, up at Lima, Ohio was debating a Church of Christ preacher. And the Church of Christ preacher had gotten a hold of the hunting regulations for 1963. And had he challenged Brother Lewis and he says, your prophet killed a pig out of season. And the hunting season that year was March 4 through 14. And if Brother Branham killed a pig on February 28th, he killed it out of season. So that motivated us to begin to ask the brothers, what, what were y'all doing over there? Well, then we found where Brother Branham was in Houston, Texas on March the 4th to get a reprieve from execution for the photographer's stepson <coughs> that had taken the, the <coughs> picture of the pillar of fire in Houston, <coughs> Texas. And because Brother Branham went there, that man gave Brother Branham the copyright and the negative of that picture. And Brother Branham and Brother Fred got in a vehicle and drove from Houston straight through, got back here on the uh, morning of the 6th, and they came over here hunting, and Brother Branham killed his pig on March the 6th. And on March the 7th is the day he went up there. And those seven angels came down to him. But those angels, that cloud had been photographed February the 28th, seven days before. Now, I've known this for 20 years. 
But I didn't have the wherewithal to challenge this or to say it. But when Sister Rebecca and Brother George began to hear about it, they published it in their magazine. And there was a number of people says, well, if he wasn't over there on the 28th when that happened, because he said so and so and so and so. But you see, Brother Branham didn't say it. We said it. Yeah. We assumed it. But then we got to looking, and in uh, June of 63, at a graduation celebration, a little party that the folks, the believers had for Brother Branham, I mean for the graduating class that year, high school kids, Brother Branham was there. And it's just on a little tape that the Normans had. And Brother Branham said, speaking about his coming to Tucson, he said, now when I come, one thing was by a vision. I was standing above Tucson up here when a blast went off. Brother Fred was there when it went off, and they took a picture, you know, in the sky, and I didn't think much about it, never noticed it. So it began to impress me somehow the other day, and Brother Norman, <coughs> Norman, that's Eugene Norman, Norma's father, he's got a daughter, his oldest daughter is named Norma. It's Norma, Mary, and Becky, isn't it? And Norma was the one graduating. Norma's father here told me, said, did you notice this? And what had happened is, is Brother Donnie Wirtz's brother, was it Willard, that had the magazine, the Life magazine? Yeah. And Brother Eugene Norman, which is his brother-in-law, because Sister Norman is Brother Donnie and Willard's sister. And Brother Norman asked his brother Willard, could I take this? I want to show it to Brother Branham. Now that came out May the 17th, Life Magazine. The picture of the cloud, cloud ring too high, too big to be true. And Brother Norman had showed it to Brother Branham, according to this right here, and that's what Brother Norman's testimony is. And he says, Brother Norman, Norman's father told me, said, did you notice this? And just as I looked at it, right there was them angels, just as plain as they could be, sitting right there in that picture. See? I looked to see when it was. It's the time, same. About day or two before, day or two after, I was up there. So Brother Bram tells us here that that picture was not the day that he was here. And when we calculate it now, it was February the 28th that the picture was taken. March the 7th, the day he killed his pig. A week. Seven days. Those angels were already here. <coughs> they were waiting for Brother Branham to come and get here. And look where it was at. Northeast of Flagstaff or Prescott, which is below Flagstaff. Well, that's just where we was at, just exactly. Well, that's right through there. Tucson's right through there, 40 miles. Flagstaff's right through there, about 200 miles. But the thing was 26 miles high, 45 kilometers. It remained illuminated 28 minutes after sunset. So there's never been another generation that's had a sign. Now, if, if something that I said about how it happened has got you confused. Go back and listen to what Brother Brown said about it in light of the first thing he ever said about it. Is it not strange that he doesn't even mention it at the seals? <coughs> he preached it in March. He never mentions the cloud. Not until June, when Brother Brown saw the picture in Life magazine, does he <coughs> mention the cloud. And then later on, in August, is when he takes and turns it sideways and he said, look, there's those angels flying right there. And Brother Branham pointed out one or two things, but since then, man, you have everybody finally, look, here's a horse and here's a man, and here's an angel. And I'm sorry, why do we have to do that? <coughs> why, why do we need anything false? We've got enough that's real, <coughs> genuine of God. <coughs> and so <coughs> Brother Branham was here, and I'm sure if you look, you can find pyramid shaped rock you can't have this one sorry this is mine today and you'll find some cuckaburs around here if you look down on the riverbed where they wash off the mountains you'll find some of the cuckaburs and if you're from overseas they're going to ask you about it they're going to take it away from you when you cross the border because they don't want those in their country they're a pest but here in america you can take them home within 
lay it up on your mantel board or your desk, you can look at them and just say, you don't want to have that cuckaburn nature. Right. You want all that out of it. Do we have any questions? I'm, I'm sorry I took so long to... This is the rock cut down there, but this is the first pond. That's the rock. Yeah, that's it. Now there were some other boulders here also, and they've pretty well been hauled off, but ones like this and like that, they haven't taken them because they're... That one, that's new here. And you know, that, that one's new. That one hadn't been here. That one and this one's been brought here since last time I was over here. For the green. Yes. Before they all spread out, could I get them together to, you know, I'd like to get the camera over there and take a picture of them. Right, if, you, if you'd like, if you don't think we'll break it. Would you mind coming together so we can get a picture of, of all of them together? <coughs> well, if we came together. Our sense is pure, sweet love, a sign from above. On the wings of the snow. Well, we can do it. You, you start it, brother. On the wings of the snow. In 1969, I saw a painting that a sister painted in this area, and when I when I looked at the painting, I said, "Oh, look at that! She put Brother Brown's profile on the end of the mountain." And uh, I called her and I asked her and said, "Sister, what what did you use to paint? Did you go over there, or did you use a photograph or something?" And she says, "No, I just painted what I saw." And I rushed right back over here because I wanted to see this profile. Come right here. It's going to be hard now, but if you look right up there, you see his forehead and his nose. Sun, sun rain, weather, erosion. To wash that mountain away like that and leave those particular pieces of rock that you walk around and look at from the other side or from the front or from the top, it just looks like blobs of dirt. Up there. But if you look at it from right here, See it? Uh -huh. Yep. And of all the places on earth, where do you see it? Huh? All the places on earth for it to be. Right here. Right. 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 And, and don't look there now. Look right out there. Right there. You see, you see that stem that goes up there? That's the top of his head. Just come right off his forehead. And there's his nose. And there's his lips. And there's his chin. And that's his chest down there. You don't see it yet? Close one eye. You're not looking at the face now. You're looking at the side. You're looking at the side of his face. Y'all don't see it, Brother Paul? Well, let's just change the position a little bit. Maybe you can. It's good back there. Oh, yeah, sometimes it's if you, right you squirrel. Sometimes right. if you just look at so that part of the top of the mountain. Brother Brown's profile of his face. Oh, 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 Hide the sun. Yeah. Right at the very top. You see the door there. You see those cactus on the side? The last prickly pear. That's his chin right there starting up. And then there's his lips. And that's his nose. And then his eyes, and then the forehead. And you're looking at it from the side, just, just like you look at me right here. Oh, 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 oh. See it? Huh? Okay, you're looking at it just like this, see? All right, gentlemen. Whoa, did I almost get in your...
Are you stopping?